one thing that neuroscience has taught me is that our, and I am not doing this on purpose, but our preconceptions uh, with <laughs> our, our preconceptions when it comes to uh, ideas of what it is to be a professional athlete, not only from a psychological and a neuroscientific standpoint, but just also from a physical standpoint of what it means biologically and, and morphologically, just the, the, the shape of one's body and, and, and the shape of one's mind, as it were. These, these, there are some very strong uh, uh, predilections to there being a kind of a type when it comes to professional athletes. And everything that we're learning about this whole business is uh, kind of disproving that a little bit. So elaborate on that for me, because my I was going to ask you, what is the biggest preconception about professional athleticism? And to me, that does strike a chord because often, I mean, like I said, I was joking, but I, unfortunately, I'm not joking. I'm five foot three. I'm not the I'm not the toughest looking guy. And often when friends are chatting, we'll, we'll joke around. Oh, well, I mean, we could never be those athletes because we're we're just that's not the way we're built to a degree. Uh, yeah. And that does factor into it at least we, I'm, I'm using we very generally. I also have very athletic friends, but <laughs> built that way. But yeah. you're saying there's a bit of a preconception there. Yeah, yeah, there really is. I actually, you know, you, you've hit on one of the things I, I find that actually the most interesting about what I've learned scientifically and neuroscientifically, you know, during this whole process of, of, uh, of you know, figuring out what I'm going to do after I quit skating. Uh, the thing is, we, we create this conception of what it is to be an athlete, right? But, you know, as soon as you scratch the surface on that idea of athlete with a capital A, you start to realize that that, that, that term doesn't really mean a lot. I mean, we can, we can just start by differentiating athletes within the same sport that they do. I mean, just look at, athletic running and look at the body type of a hundred meter sprinter compared to a marathon runner. I mean, one looks completely different morphologically from the other. And those differences are partly due to their training regimen, but they're also clearly due to basic features of their biology that are connected to their genes and connected to how those genes have interacted with their environment. And the fascinating thing is, now, if you're, if you're going to say, oh, that person is a good athlete, what exactly are we saying when we, when we ask that, when we make that statement? A good athlete at what? I mean, uh, if, if you grow up somewhere in Kenya, right, somewhere at a higher altitude around where the Kalenji tribe hangs out, and you just so happen to have a set of genes just, you know, it's a combination of who your parents were and a little bit of randomness and an interaction with the environment and the process of gestation. You find yourself with a set of genes that are just really good for sprinting, you know, 100 meter sprints. You know, you do a vertical jump and you find yourself way up in the air compared to your, compared to your uh, uh, compatriots. But it just so happens, you, you know, you're a Kalenji, uh, 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 you're a Kalenji tribesman and the whole the whole group of, of, of athletes you know, within that part of the world are not only genetically predisposed to being excellent long distance runners, but they're also running all the time, right? but they're running really long distances. Now, you know, if you find yourself in that position, you'll be, you'll be perceived as a terrible runner because I mean, you're not good at long distances. Your, your, your biology, your genes and, and you know, what you've been given, you know, with relation to the genetic lottery, but also just <clears throat> maybe, you know, how, how your, uh, uh, how your upbringing has, has, has played out from the moment that, you know, gestation begins, uh, and you're still in your mother's womb, just made you a really good sprinter. Well, in that case, that, that phenotype of being an excellent sprinter is just not going to come out in the way that it otherwise would. And, and people will perceive you as a bad athlete. I mean, you can be an excellent sprinter, but I guess you could call it the ugly duckling effect, right? I mean, we have this conception of what an excellent athlete is based on these completely arbitrary parameters. And if you don't fit those parameters, well, you know, you have a big problem. 
I mean, I was a really good speed skater, but uh, I don't see my chances as being super high at having made it to the top of, I don't know, a sport like baseball. <laughs> I mean, if my snowball throwing is anything <laughs> to go by, as I was growing up in Canada, getting beamed from the back by just endless, you know, avid baseball playing uh, students in my school is anything to go by. I'm just really lucky that I didn't go out for baseball. But you, you, you're totally, you're hitting on a point. I mean, what is an athlete, right? And like you said, the build of a baseball player is, I mean, first of all, there's many different builds of a baseball player, depending on what position you play. And second of all, if you're comparing the build of a baseball player to a speed skater, both are considered high performance athletes, but. Right. Because the, the, the funniest thing is that uh, when people think about athletes, they have this conception that athletes are kind of generally good at sports. And, and, and I, I get I get this all the time and I know that my colleagues get this as well, right? As a former Olympic athlete, you have this kind of badge that you can wear. And if, if you go into a weight room or if you, if, if you go bowling with your friends or whatever, so, oh, well, but he was in the Olympics. Let's see what he can do. And what they fail to realize is that I can do nothing in bowling. I'm a terrible bowler, you know, like this stuff doesn't track. One, one specific highly trained ability does not proffer one with this endless bouquet of other, you know, physiological abilities in completely different areas of sport. That's just not how it works, right? But, but that's, you know, the funny thing is that's not a fun story. It's not a fun story for people to hear, but it's also not a marketable story for the former professional athletes. You know, they want to market themselves as special, right? Because after you've done, after you're done being an athlete and you don't decide to spend 10 years in, in, uh, in higher education, like I've, suffered through well then you're often going to just sell yourself as this former athlete right and then you want to kind of embellish the concept of yourself as a former athlete as much as possible so that people listen to you because <laughs> like why else are they going to listen to you if they don't think that what you did was incredibly special not only on a level uh, that is related to that sport but also just kind of generally right that's the, that's the narrative that people want to sell. So, so there's pressure from the society to embellish these people's accomplishments from a sports standpoint. And there's also pressure from the athlete themselves to do this because it's, it's their bread and butter, right? So you can see how this problem arises. I, I think a lot of people listening to this, including myself, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk to you at the moment of an event. Uh, when you're training years for that speed skating Olympic race, how on earth do you prepare for that moment? How do you keep yeah. yourself calm? What are some of the, I don't want to say tricks because that, that minimizes it, but what are some of the tenets that a lot of athletes would kind of follow in not letting the moment be too big? Because I think that is just so hard for people to wrap their head around, inclu including myself. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, yeah it, it, is, it, is, it is quite challenging and, and it is a process. I would say that, one of the things that really, really helped me was I remember uh, uh, exiting the uh, uh, the exiting the tunnel that opens up onto the inside of the uh, of the ice track where you prepare to get your skates on and get ready to skate the Olympic race. And, and uh, this was Torino, two thousand. Yeah, this was in in Torino exactly, and um, and I I remember. I remember that moment and, and there, there were other moments, you know, world championships and, uh, and, and, and world cups and just, just large important events in, uh, in, in, a, in a sports career where, you know, you, you, you exit onto that uh, kind of pre-staging um, place, you know, whether it's a dressing room or whether it's, whether it's the center of the ice where you put your skates on. And in the beginning of my career, sometimes that experience felt, quite daunting and, and quite scary and felt maybe like what the, the emotions that I was having were probably uh, not going to help me on this journey to skating a good race. Uh, and later on in my career, I remember one of the things that, one of the things that really helped me get through that period was in that moment of preparation, 
I would just sit for a second and realize how incredibly fortunate I was to have this opportunity to do this. And the fact that fighting against this kind of nagging sense of anxiety and anticipation was the, the, the simple fact that I was doing this thing that I really liked. And I had this opportunity to do it, you know, with these fancy national team clothes on and skating against all these people from all over the world who by some, you know, incredible fortune had the opportunity like me to fly to the other side of the planet and race against each other in this crazy sport called speed skating. I mean, that, that sense of joy that you can derive from having, for, from, from getting the opportunity to do something incredibly special was for me the antidote to the worry that this incredibly special thing was at an imminent risk of going, of going south, of going wrong. And um, learning to embrace that feeling of, of joy in the face of this huge oncoming challenge. That is, that's the, I mean, that's the work of a lifetime or at least a, a, the work of a sports, uh, of a professional sports lifetime. But it's, uh, it was for me one of the most important uh, aspects of, of, of embracing my uh, professional career as an athlete and something that I think may be transferable to uh, other great challenges that, that one experiences.